has, but there's not high contrast here on the screen, is there? Yeah, you should go that way. Talk, 2000, December. I don't think so. I could be wrong, but uh, that's the last talk I gave here. <laughs> here. Okay, thank you, Andrew. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back. It's been almost eight years. I hardly uh, don't know where the time has gone. It was a lot colder then, I remember, in December, but uh, the sun was still shining. So yeah, um, I'm here today to try and tell you something about um, theoretical expectation for how the first nonlinear structures in the universe, uh, you know, what they were like, what happened when gas cooled and uh, in, in these sort of dark matter mini halos at the very highest redshifts. What I show on the left here is a a theorist's uh, view of this, or numericist view of this, this is a, a picture from a, a simulation that uh, comes from the, uh, the uh, Greg Bryan, Mike Norman, and, and Tom Abell group, um, sh actually from a 2000 paper, two, 2002 paper, which shows the gas structure um, at about redshift of 18, 19, um, in, a dark, uh, in, a, uh, in a, a dark matter halo, which has about a million solar masses. These are called uh, mini halos. And these are just about the minimum mass uh, size dark matter halo you need to, that uh, it has a deep enough potential to allow baryons to uh, cool and, and fall into this, uh, settle into the center of this halo. So I'm gonna, un I'm gonna basically spend most of my time talking about what we think happens uh, next. You know, what, what is this thing gonna do? Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be giving a lecture in, in the astronomy department about star formation uh, more locally, and we'll see that um, even though you know, local star formation that we can observe in great fine detail just a few thousand light years away, um, there's still a huge number of open questions in this area as well. So one, one wonders if we can make any kinds of predictions or how reliable our predictions would be um, in the very early universe, and I'll try and motivate why maybe the situation is slightly different there, and maybe you know how confident we are in, in what we're doing at high redshift. So my collaborators on this project, uh, Chris McKee at UC Berkeley, uh, Eric Blackman at Rochester, Aravind Natarajan at uh, Bielefeld now, formerly at Florida, and then uh, Brian O'Shea and Dan Whalen uh, from Los Alamos. I think Brian O'Shea is moving to Michigan soon. Okay, so the outline, the basic uh, picture, our, our standard view of how the universe has got to where it is today, the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago, recombination, um, a million years after that, uh, the universe is becoming neutral, entering the so-called dark ages where there's no, no light around or just the microwave background, no, no, no visible light. And then what happens next? And really, this is an important, of course, because this, these processes are gonna determine the foundations for everything else that's gonna happen. You know, all the rest of galaxy formation, evolution, you know, how did the quasars and supermassive black holes form? Basically, everything else is sort of built on, on this foundation. And, uh, you know, I don't quote from the Bible very often, 
but I recall, uh, I recall some vaguely some story about trying not to build your, a foundation on sand or you know, you really have it on rock. And the question is, you know, how, how, how secure is our foundation here? Okay. Because really a lot of it, a lot of other things depend on that. Okay. So in another outline, which I can really describe to you is, is the, the different physical processes I'd like to talk about. You know, in short, what, what is done these days is to follow cosmological numerical simulations involving the gas and the cooling, the dark matter. They see dense structures form. They can't follow them too much further than this when the densities get very high. And so at this point, we try and develop analytic models for the star formation process. And these are the physical effects we're trying to account for. Um, we would like to understand at what rate this gas will collapse to the center, then the structure of any kind of disk that forms around uh, any central object there, the structure of the, of the star itself when it's accreting, which is uh, referred to as a protostar, a star still gaining mass. Um, possible influence of magnetic fields. Can they be generated in this uh, nonlinear structure now, this, this accretion disk? And if they are, what, what effect does that have on the accretion flow? And then perhaps the most important uh, physical processes we think are, are, are setting the, the final mass of star that results from this collapse are radiative feedback processes, and particular ionization of the structure. And so I, I'll talk in, in detail about that. And then um, I have some time to talk about the possible effects of more, more speculatively about extra heating that could come from dark matter annihilation, um, given standard, our standard expectations uh, for WIMP uh, dark matter. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, structure is, is, is uh, forming in the dark matter. We have recombination at redshift uh, 1200 or so. Um, there's thermal equilibration between uh, the CMB and the, uh, the gas until about a redshift of 160. That's because we have residual electrons still around able to do that. Um, if you actually work out what the genes mass of gas is um, at this time, it's of order 10 to the 5 solar masses. Actually, this is a cosmological genes mass, a total mass, including the dark matter. And it's actually independent of redshift. It depends here on temperature over the, the cube root of density. And because of these scalings, uh, this genes mass is actually constant during this time. And actually fairly similar, incidentally, to you know, a globular cluster scale masses. Well, what the connection is there, no one's really sure. Uh, then at some point, uh, say re below redshift of 160, we have a thermal decoupling of the gas. It cools down much more rapidly now uh, by adiabatic expansion than, than the microwave background. And uh, we, uh, then at some point, we have nonlinear structures forming. We know the universe becomes reionized at some redshift, maybe say 10 here. And once you heat up to temperatures of order uh, 10 to the 4 Kelvin, appropriate for ionized gas, then your, your genes mass is, is raised up to more galactic scales of order 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses. So the question is exactly how this transition happens. Now, we think uh, what's the first structures that, uh, that are going to form are, are stellar in, in nature, so m probably massive stars. But exactly what their mass is is, uh, is, is really, you know, I'd say, cutting edge of science right now. And it's important for a number of topics. You know, as I say, these, these stars are probably responsible for reionizing the universe. So obviously, the, the, um, the amount of mass in your star determines greatly its ionizing photon output. And in particular, also the helium reionization could be particularly sensitive to the, the very hot photospheres we expect from these popu so-called population three stars. And there are a number of observational constraints coming along and uh, have been claims of uh, observed signatures of when exactly re reionization is. Then if they are massive stars, of course, they'll explode as, as uh, supernovae. And the kinds of elements that are produced in those supernovae and the kind of remnants that are produced will depend on the mass. The amount of light that's coming out, in, in principle, could be detected. And, and there have, been, again, been claims from this by looking at in the near infrared, uh, looking at the overall intensity, but also the fluctuations. Again, there's a lot of controversy as to whether we're actually seeing a signal here. And then if, if you are lucky enough to see an individual um, event or supernova go off, in principle, you know, from a very massive star, um, a, a very, you know, a, a very energetic uh, parent stability supernova from such a star uh, probably is bright enough to be seen with JWST. It's just the, the expected rates are actually quite low, and so we'd, we'd, be quite l we'd have to be quite lucky to see that. That's the claim. No one really knows how to make gamma ray bursts. Um, there's, there are reasons to expect maybe they're, they're less common from metal poor stars, but um, in principle, perhaps they could be observed as well. 
So these are the importance of understanding what is the mass scale for our stars. But as I'd say the main motivation is this foundation. What, what is, how, how do we start the galaxy formation process off? How do we understand uh, supermassive black hole formation? OK. Um, another attraction to this problem is its relative uh, simplicity. It's, it's a well-defined problem. It's, we have um, initial conditions which are set from cosmology. And so you know, we have a standard framework to paradigm to work with. And different groups can agree on, on, those, on those initial conditions and, and compare their results. So that's an attractive feature of this problem, which is often not the case in when trying to model uh, local star formation. You have different groups working on many different aspects of a problem, not really doing this, the same uh, things. Uh, also, traditionally, it's been thought magnetic fields are supposed to be dynamically unimportant in, in this, in this uh, at least in the initial stages. So this graph just shows you how sensitive the ionizing photon output is to stellar mass. If you go from a 10 solar mass star to a 100 solar mass star, the uh, rate at which you uh, photons that can ionize hydrogen increases by about three orders of magnitude. So particularly if, if the mass scale is in this range, then that can have, have a very important consequences for, for the ability of the first stars to reionize the universe. And then this is a famous diagram from uh, the w Hager and Woosley's group which basi basically they try and follow the evolution, the stellar evolution of metal-free stars and predict what the final outcome is. So as a function of stellar mass here, uh, what they're basically showing is different regimes. The solid black line here, uh, this is also mass on the y-axis, if you can see at the back there, but um, this is the expected mass of the, of the remnant that's produced. And there are a number of features in this diagram, basically above about 140 solar masses, uh, you're, you're transitioning to a kind of supernova, or basically a, a pair instability starts to operate. You're reaching temperatures in the center of the star where you create electron-positron pairs, they can annihilate, neutrinos are lost, you're losing uh, energy support from the center of the star, and uh, that, that can lead to an instability, which um, in, in, if you're between 140 solar masses and about 260, um, that can actually lead to rapid contraction, which initiates explosive nuclear burning, uh, much like uh, in a type 1a uh, white, white dwarf, the analogy, and that explosive nuclear burning completely disrupts the star, at least that's the prediction, and so you have no remnant mass produced here, and a lot of metals injected into, into the intergalactic medium. Once you're above about 260 uh, solar masses, I think it is, the temperatures you reach in that collapse, in, uh, in that initial collapse, uh, become so high that you actually have the, the energies of the photons are, are high enough to photo disintegrate nuclei in here and prevent that explosive nuclear burning, and you have direct, more direct collapse to a, a, a black hole. So essentially, all the mass is going into a, a black hole. And perhaps this is relevant for, for the, being the seeds of supermassive black holes. Now, of course, there are, you know, there are a lot of uncertainties in these models, and in particular, these are, these are for non-rotating stars. Uh, the, many other uncertainties in there as well, but you know, a, a number of different groups agree on these, these basic features that you should see um, for supernova remnants as a function of mass. Okay, so you probably know that star formation is, is a very active field these days. Um, you know, why is that? Well, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's, uh, you know, this, it's, a, it's a very you know, rich problem. We have physics in principle is simple. Gravity uh, being compressing gas, gathering it, gathering it together, and that, that, that uh, gravity is being resisted by various kinds of pressure forces. So from thermal pressures to uh, magnetic pressures, uh, sources of non-thermal motions, inc including turbulence maybe, um, radiation pressure from embedded sources in the gas, uh, even cosmic rays. Um, so you really need to, to, to sort of solve this problem. We'd like to write down equations which would describe the evolution of these various uh, pressure uh, terms. And uh, you know, really you'd have to follow the heating and cooling of the gas, the de decay and the generation of turbulence, the diffusion of magnetic fields, the generation of fields, etc. So already you can see it's starting to get quite complicated. Um, the, the chemical properties of the gas and dust may need to be followed as well. And so if you could write down, all, you write down all these equations which describe the evolution of these physical processes, you also need to s solve them over a, a very large range of scales, about 10 orders of magnitude at least, and at least for local star formation, multidimensional problem. And at least locally, the initial conditions and boundary conditions are not that well specified. We have to typically get them from observations. Um, and so you know, I in this sense, this has made the problem extremely difficult to solve. Now, one fundamental problem about trying to solve this on a, on a computer, say, is that the time steps you need to resolve uh, are basically the you know, order the, 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 the freefall time or the dynamical time, 
And as the densities get extremely high in this collapse process, these time scales get very short. And so you, you run into, you know, you, your computers basically run into a grind to a halt trying to resolve the, the highest density regions of the, of the simulation. So for example, in, in those early simulations from, of, uh, you know, population three mini halos forming, um, you know, what, they basically got to the point where they're reaching densities almost at stellar densities, but the time step is so short that you know, one hour of computer time, they're waiting for the huge supercomputer to run, advances the simulation by you know, about 30 minutes of real time, in, in sort of simulated time. So you know, as I'll show, this, this star formation pro process probably takes hundreds of thousands of years, and that, you know, they don't want to be waiting around. Uh, it's not a good PhD project to give to your student uh, if, if it's going to take that long to run. And it's, you know, it's a fundamental problem here. So then, of course, this, this allows for theorists who are doing analytic work to come in and, and try and uh, you know, help out uh, here by making, obviously, simplifying assumptions that maybe the, the star can be treated as being in equilibrium or there's some vertical equilibrium in the disk, and then you can simplify the problem. Um, you know, we do not have a complete theory of star formation, but if we did, I think it, when it comes, it's going to have to rest on, to be stable, rest on these three pillars which have been developed, um, the analytic theory to describe these physical processes, um, at least locally, we have to constrain this very tightly with observations, and then the advance of, of solving these, these equations with, with advanced numerical methods. Now, in the population three case, we don't have that third leg to stand on, so we're sort of wobbling around a little bit, but what's, what saves us is the initial conditions. So at least we have a, it's still wobbly, but at least it's a well, sort of well-specified table that you know, may have a chance of standing up, we'll see. Okay, let me just talk about a little bit about definitions. Uh, so population one and population two stars. Population three, um, been a little bit of uh, debate about exactly what we mean. Um, Chris McKee basically came up with a definition which involves a population three star having, having a metallicity that's so low, not necessarily sort of formally zero, of course there's, there's, there's elements from the, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, but a metallicity is so low that its, its formation and its evolution, its nucleosynthetic evolution, does not depend on whatever metallicity it has. Okay? So for formation, for example, that would mean the coolants are mostly due to species which were already present coming out of the Big Bang, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Okay, um, then we can distinguish two kinds of population three stars. 3.1 are those where the initial conditions are affected solely by cosmology. So solely by whatever power spectrum you want to put in. They've been unaffected to some level um, by surrounding astrophysical sources, stars or AGN or whatever. Whereas population 3.2 stars would still have this very low metallicity, but their initial conditions could be affected by surrounding uh, astrophysical sources. Mostly I'll be talking about population 3.1 because that's what's uh, most well specified and we can follow. So I'd like to talk about the initial conditions and then these other effects. And then I'll, I'll, I'll talk, you know, once we've established or at least a theory for how these things are going to behave, what the effects of, of the subsequent evolution on, on the surroundings are. Okay, so again, the simulations, redshift 18 here, you've got gas collected in this dark matter mini halo. They're resolving down to scales of order, um, as I say, astronomical units or even sub-astronomical units, reaching densities almost to stellar densities. Uh, what, what we see in this then is a, a quasi-hydrostatic collection of gas, and that's because the, the cooling rates are very low. Uh, there's not many coolants in here, it's mostly molecular hydrogen that's um, been, been formed uh, through a catalysis with uh, free electrons going through H minus. So you have a trace amount of molecular hydrogen in here, able to cool the gas down to about 200 Kelvin or so. so that's sort of the lowest uh, temperature you can cool down to through these row vibrational transitions of H2. That, if, with that temperature, and if you know the main coolant, that defines a critical density. Okay, so that's, you know, once you're above this density, then you're, you're being collisionally de-excited. More often, you're radiatively de-exciting. And that's, at about, that's a density of about 10 to the for, um, for this, 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 uh, this transition. So 
that's a that's a stage where the gas is going to try is is going to basically hang up in its evolution because once you go above the critical density, the cooling efficiency goes down. So let's let me summarize the basic properties of, of these of this gas uh, halo. So we have several thousand solar masses inside about 10 parsecs, a mean density well below that critical density, and the trace fraction 10 to minus 3 of H2, and temperatures anywhere from 200 Kelvin and, and, and somewhat higher than that. Ten to minus three is what is seen coming out of these cosmological simulations, which they follow the hydrodynamics and the, chemi the chemistry. I think it's the, yeah, the formation of H two is catalyzed by. No, no, the, the, the free electron fraction is much lower. The, the, the electron fraction is much lower, okay, but it's catalyzed by it. So the amount of H2 you build up does not have to equal the free electron fraction. Okay. Um, at high densities, you can form H2 in another way, which is three body through three body processes. And that starts to become important only at densities of order 10 to the 10 or so. So really in the center of the structure. Uh, One-dimensional simulations have, have have, have been able to follow this um, to, to really to, to actually see the star forming. And indeed, some of the, the latest three-dimensional simulations have, have seen now a quasi-static structure which corresponds to a protostar. Um, and you know, various other cooling processes be become important, including collision-induced absorption. Um, but but as I was mentioning before, that you cannot really follow this, um, this evolution much further because you're really having now to resolve very short time steps. But an, an initial estimate of the size of the star when it forms has been claimed to about uh, 10, 14 uh, solar radii or so. So this is the, your, now you're talking about the 3.1. Yes. 3.1, you're saying, is uh, by no influence, it means that there's no other population free star in the Hubble body at this time. No, it, 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 it could be, um, I, I haven't defined what I mean by significant influence. Um, but its, its formation has only been affected by the cosmological initial conditions. So there could have been, could have been a low mass star over here. Maybe it had put out some, you know, FUV light that dissociated a few molecules, but not but a very insignificant fraction. That that would still be 3.1. But isn't the problem with H2 that you don't need UV light and even optical light can dissociate H2? So even a low mass star can not affect the H2 oscillation significantly. So isn't well, you need you need far ultraviolet. You need between about 11, 11 to 13 electron volts or so. To dissociate H2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lyman Groener. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about what, uh, we'll, we'll talk about those, what, what effect they have. Right. At some point, there would have been one of these guys. Okay. Let's just let's let's work on that one. And I think we'll see. As we'll see, what's been found now is actually the effect of FUV dissociation on H2 is actually fairly limited, quite local. Even if you had a hundred solar mass star, probably is not going to affect things beyond a, a kiloparsec or so. Okay. Um, this shows the this shows then the evolution in time from going to later and later times of this gas structure, it's cooling very weakly, it's, it's settling in this potential, it's getting denser and denser, but very slowly. It's, it, that's, that's an important point to emphasize. It's, it's quasi-hydrostatic contraction here. And the structure that eventually results from this contraction um, is actually fairly simple. It's reasonably well described by a power law, where the density is falling off with radius to the minus 2.2 power, so a little bit steeper than isothermal. So it's actually a little bit hotter in the center than the outer edge. Um, and that's because actually the cooling efficiency is going down. In, in the central region. Um, and so this, this structure, we have a hope of modeling um, its evolution. You know, once, this, once it's got to the stellar density, uh, there are solutions, um, including some worked out by Ralph here, um, for the collapse of such structures. So these are the latest simulations, by Yosh or some of the latest by Yoshida et al. Here's reaching densities of 10 to the 15 hydrogens per cubic centimeter. And again, seeing that structure. And again, just to emphasize, this was at redshift 19. This is nine million years later, uh, you know, and then the, the time step's getting shorter. There's a 200 year difference between here and here, but it's it's a very slow, gr gradual process. 
OK, so we model this structure as a, a polytrope. And we describe then this is the power law and density. K is 2.2 .2 here, minus 2.2. Uh, treated as a singular polytropic sphere in virial hydrostatic equilibrium. Model that, that pressure then as, as a function of density to the, to the gamma here. And um, gamma 1.1 is what you need to satisfy this, this structure. And then this normalization constant K depends on the entropy of the gas. But that's, no, that's set at some point by the fact that this, this halo, a, a density of pa passing through the critical point of uh, a density of 10 to the 4 and this uh, minimum temperature of 200 Kelvin. So if you, if you actually use these numbers, we, we actually use 300 Kelvin because it's to uh, account for some weak amount of turbulence in the gas, sonic scale turbulence, then that sets a normalization for this K uh, parameter here, what we call the entropy parameter of this equation of state. And for these, pra these parameters, we, we then uh, basically normalize and, and say K primed is normalized to this fiducial value. And the models I'll show then I'll, then, I'll say there's a K prime model of one. That's the fiducial case where you have this normalization. But um, if the gas had been able to cool to lower temperatures, then it would have a lower value of, of, of K prime. This is just normalizing. So when it was at a density of 10 to the 4, it had about this temperature. And, and that sets the normalization point for this. That's the critical density for the, for the H2 cooling, the vibrational transitions, the lower ones, when they're being excited by atomic hydrogen, remember, because that's the, the dominant species, then that's the critical density. So that's the if, you, if you are uh, above that density, then you're collisionally de-excited at a faster rate than you radiatively decay. So above the density, you don't still radiate anymore? Uh, to a less, uh, lesser extent, yes. OK, so then given, given that structure, you can work out what the uh, collapse rate should be. It's similar to this, the solution for a singular isothermal sphere, generalized by uh, Hunter in 77, uh, because in fact, there are inward motions here. It's, this thing is settling at about a third of the sound speed, so we use a, a solution due to Hunter. And then that, that, that solution predicts what the accretion rate should be as a function of, the, of, of how dense that structure was, which depends on this K prime parameter. The higher the value of K primed, the denser the structure, so that the higher the, these temperatures, basically the entropy in here, the higher that was at the point of collapse means you can support a denser structure at the point of collapse. A denser structure will, for a given mass, uh, enclosed mass, um, will um, collapse at a faster rate. The freefall time will be shorter, and so you have a higher accretion rate. For typical values then, where this K primed is one, when, this, when the collapse mass is, is about one, you having accretion rates a few hundredths of a solar mass per year. And it's declining in time and or collapsed mass because this density structure was steeper than the singular isothermal sphere. Remember, your, the shoe solution gives you a constant accretion rate. For the steeper density profile, you will have a declining accretion rate. And so that's why we have this uh, minus 3 sevenths power here. Yeah, so, sorry, time, 41 years, yes, one solar mass. Yeah, so that's not, not unreasonable, Chris, yeah. Um, <laughs> who's, your st who's your next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and especially if K primed is a bit higher, yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, um, actually that's an important point though. So for example, one, one limit you might think to this process for the star formation is the, the main sequence lifetime of the, the stellar evolution lifetime of, of a star, which at high masses asymptotes to about three million years or so. So you can work out, you know, at, with this kind of accretion rate, how, how massive could you get to in three million years? Um, and it's about 2,000 solar masses or so. So if there were no other feedback processes going on, just the sort of supernova explosion at the end, uh, tells you something about that, that mass scale. Yes, Ralph? So in fact, how do you resolve that among some simple flat cross sections like that? Mm -hmm. The collapse rate would be, of course, much higher than the sudden sharp back to normal. Right. Right. So it doesn't get this long period. Right. So it'd be more complicated. Right. So you're just taking this as a minimum. Um, well, but, so let's see here. Th th this is a simulation result where they, they, 
you know, at, at what point do, do you call T0? Okay? It's, it's the point when you need something to trigger dynamical collapse in, in this very central region. What, what is probably happening is once you're above densities of 10 to the 10, then you've got this rapid three-body H2 formation. So you've got a fully molecular core, which is now much more efficient at cooling. That collapses quite quickly. Um, and then that's the seed for subsequent evolution. Um, you know, this, this behavior looks quite self-similar over most of the mass range here. It's only a negligible amount of mass in that, that, in that very high density core there. So where is this measured? Where is it measured? What, what, I've, I've measured it as a function of collapsed mass. So that, mass that's the that's the, it's a singular point. No, 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 no. I, I've measured it. The solutions predict what the mass is going to be, that the mass accretion rate is going to be as a function of collapsed mass or of time. Okay? So by collapsing, you mean reaching the central area of mass? Yeah, reaching the central, uh, reaching the central point source. We'll, we'll generalize to a disk in a second, but... Um, yeah, so that, that's what, how, what, how we've defined it. In the simulations, of course, when they cannot follow that evolution, they have done something different. They've, they've measured it as in, in mass shells going out before, really, the, the star has grown. So I'm comparing our analytic uh, result here, which is this, this uh, sort of straight dark line with various numerical estimates, uh, which basically agree, I think uh, I would say, within the factors of a few. And I, I wouldn't push it more than that. This diversion down here is because they haven't, you know, in these early simulations, they didn't have all the cooling processes in. This is really before the star has formed. Again, here's from Yoshida, it's got a bit further. But this is the, the behavior here. Um, Brom put in a sink particle in one of his SPH simulations and saw this kind of behavior. So maybe this is showing more what Ralph has been talking about, the sort of somewhat elevated accretion rates early on, but then uh, declining to, to, to sort of similar values here. Uh, to what we, we estimate. In any case, K prime is our parameter, and we can slide that up and down. And actually, what, some, um, what O'Shea and Norman have found recently is when they try and measure this, this infall rate from their cores as a function of redshift, they have 12 halos they've looked at. The ones at higher redshift actually have smaller values of the accretion rate than the ones at lower redshift. And that's because the ones at higher redshift, there was a higher residual amount of uh, free electrons still around, they could catalyze a larger amount of H2, which could then cool the gas more efficiently and reduce that uh, entropy parameter. So there's a range of K primed here, probably a factor of five or six uh, from redshift of 30 to 20. And we'll see what effect that has. Okay, in the simulations, they see the, co the cores are rotating. Okay, they're not, uh, it's not, not gonna be spher pure spherical collapse. And we can parameterize that rotation so we have, we have one parameter, K prime, that measures the entropy of the gas at the point of collapse. Then we have the, the amount of rotation, and we parameterize that through this F sub Keplerian, which is just the ratio of the uh, circular velocity average on a mass shell to uh, its Keplerian velocity. And what's seen in the simulations here is that's of order uh, a half or so um, as a fairly independent of enclosed mass. So there has been already in the simulation some angular momentum transfer, perhaps through a system of uh, weak shocks or so, in, in, in this, uh, this core. We assume, we are gonna have to assume that angular momentum is conserved inside the sonic point of the accretion flow. And if you do that, you can work out a circularization radius or disk radius as a function then of the collapsed mass. And for our fiducial value of a half, 0.5, for this, this rotation parameter, that's a few AU once the solar mass has collapsed. But it's gonna grow as the, as the more uh, extended mass shells come in and the mass grows. Okay, and this is the geometry from the Ulrich solution, the classical solution used for local star formation of these uh, free-flowing streamlines which are conserving angular momentum from the sonic point, joining a disk uh, some at this, the end of the red line here. And in each of these uh, sectors here, 10% of the mass is, uh, is coming through here. So you see a concentration of the mass accretion rate in the equatorial regions to the feed the disk relatively low densities above, in the polar region above the star. Now, once you have a disk, what's going to happen? Well, some kind of viscous process, we think, is going to operate to, to transfer angular momentum outwards and, and mass inwards. And probably at the beginning, that viscosity will be, will be driven by self-gravity. What we're going to have to do is assume some value of a viscosity parameter. In this case, uh, we'll try 0.3. That roughly what uh, Charles Gamme sees, at least in his two-dimensional simulations. 
um, and then see what happens to such a disk, or model the structure of such a disk. Oh, that's way inside. Way inside. Yes. And I guess I'm, I'm still missing something. So you, you've got an SS total of minus 2.2. Yes. Um, but and that's for a self traveling in gas, uh, which, is eight, which is adiabatic inside for the whole range that you're talking about. So you have gamma of fractures. No, no, gamma, gamma was 1.1. 1 .1. The, the gas is cooling. Yes. So, so this critical in the board, what are the, what are the changes there? Changes the well, the parameter basically describes the entry profile of the gas at the point of protostar formation, T0 for us. During that further infall, yes, some, some, there will be some cooling. But uh, it's that initial condition we need. OK. So what we're going to do then is we have this feeding rate to the disk. We have an idea of the size of the disk. We'll, for the moment, just then just assume an alpha of 0.3. We can try other values and construct simple models for the, both the disk but also the protostar that's being fed at such a rate. And so this is what we did a few years ago, simple you know, standard Shakura Sanai of disk models. Uh, we do allow for the effect that we're having to ionize and dissociate the gas. That's qu quite important when you have these low stellar masses and um, you know, all the gas you're creating is neutral, of course. So that changes the, the temperature structure a little bit. Um, but basically, we can go ahead and, and, and construct these, these kinds of models. One question we can address then is, for, for this given level of viscosity, does, the, say, the tomb ray parameter ever become less than 1 in, the, in these, in these uh, regions of the disks? And we find it, it does not. So that was uh, one point. We don't expect fragmentation if the viscosity can maintain a level appropriate to 0.3. Yes, Caitlin? Right. At this point, at this point, the disk is go is, is going to become optically thin, and so we, we we don't we have not modeled that that phase. Right. Yeah. So actually, what we argue is that in reality, um, the viscosity is going to be lower than 0.3. The disk mass will have to build up to a higher level until it becomes mildly self gravitating, but then that value of viscosity is sufficient to, to drain the disk at a rate faster than the supply rate. Did you start setting previously the thing you We've not done constant Q models, no. OK. Um, now, there could be trace amounts of magnetic field around. The Beeman battery, um, so if there's radiation fields and you have free electrons, there could be charge separation, and uh, you know, there, there are predictions for what kind of field strength you get out in these uh, vicinities of these dark matter mini halos. Um, estimates range, you know, pretty uncertain, but range, range from anywhere from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 24 Gauss. Uh, so not dynamically important. But these, given that there's some trace amount of ionization, these fields will be dragged in with the, with the flow. You can work out that, that the flux reasoning is going to be very good in this situation. Um, and then if you, once you have a nonlinear structure where there's the, the, the gas is maybe orbiting for so now many or several dynamical times, you have a chance to maybe amplify the field, stretch it out. Um, and in particular, this, this uh, sort of a, a disk dynamo could begin to operate. So we basically, you know, in the context of our alpha disk models, saw, and, and for a given seed field, saw you know, how long you needed to uh, basically amplify your field um, to a point where it starts to become dynamically significant and reach some kind of equipartition value. Um, that was shown, that's shown in this diagram. This is the collapsed mass, and then this is the accretion rate up here. So as time go, goes on, the star is gaining mass, and then once you cross these lines, you reach a point where the magnetic field has been amplified exponentially to the point where it's it's uh, reached a saturation point. And so if you start with some level of seed, you know, th th these different lines, you know, basically assume, make different assumptions of whether the, the field, for example, is complete, perfectly frozen in the disk and whether it's advected into the star or whether it's uh, sort of diff diffusing but maintaining a fairly constant radial location in the disk. Um, we tried lots of different things and a range of different uh, start starting field strengths. Basically, we're finding 
once we're at a few solar masses, um, there has been plenty of dynamical times for amplification, you know, to exponential amplification of the field to uh, saturate, to reach saturation levels. So in all our models, you know, certainly by 10 or 20 solar masses, you know, I think we, can ex we could expect um, dynamically important fields to exist in the disk. That wouldn't affect the feeding rate of, of the core, because th these fields would only exist in the central part, you know, in, in the inner regions, but um, you know, their effects then perhaps cannot be, should not be neglected. And in particular, one thing they could do is provide another source of viscosity in the disk. I mean, it becomes harder and harder for self-gravity to provide a source of viscosity in the inner parts of disks. So maybe, uh, maybe these fields could, could do that. This only this requires significant ionization, but we checked that, and that's, that's fine. Okay, for the star, what we've done is model it as a, a one-zone model with a simple polytropic structure and follow the energy in the star. The energy in the star, uh, this is self-gravity, and then there's really just a small term due to the fact that we're starting up, we defined our zero point of the energy as, as being uh, you know, a fully molecular gas, and we have to ionize it up. Uh, so that's just this ionization potential. Then as matter is accreted to the star, so the energy of the star can change by accretion of material with some enthalpy. There's a luminosity from the star, energy escaping, uh, and, and then nuclear burning. And so we basically follow this, adding a few things to do with the deuterium burning. And we don't really do a full stellar evolution code here. Again, it's just a one-zone model. Um, but we you know, compare our results to, to, to more accurate codes and find that we can uh, make predictions for the size of the star, which is what we're most interested in as a function of the stellar, the collapsed stellar mass. And the basic picture is the star is going to exist in some inflated, um, you know, expanded state early on, too, too low a density to be uh, uh, undergoing hydrogen fusion in the center. Um, and then it's, but after a certain amount of time, basically a, kel a local Kelvin time, it, it can radiate away enough energy to, to contract down to the main sequence, reach central temperatures high enough to, to initiate um, hydrogen burning. Basically, th this is the pre-main sequence. Well, this is a protostellar stage, though, actually. So um, those tracks would start once you shut off accretion. But uh, here we're still accreting. Now, if you had a high accretion rate, you could reach a relatively high mass before you were older than your local Kelvin-Helmholtz time. And so you would reach the main sequence at a later stellar mass, a larger stellar mass. If you have a low accretion rate, you've got more time, you, then you're going to contract and reach the main sequence at a lower mass. That's the basic picture. So this is our, this is, this is our result for the our test case for a spherical accretion. Actually, become, the, the accretion flow becomes optically thick above the stellar surface in this case. So we have to allow for that. Um, and we, we compare to the more detailed models of, of Francesco Paller and Steve Stahler and find good agreement um, of this evolution. And then what we've done is just um, generalize these then to our expected accretion rates with a k primed of one or different values, and also with rotation. In when you have a rotating structure, um, your photosphere is, you, you basically, the accretion flow does not become optically thick around the star, at least most of the star. And so that changes the evolution a little bit. And um, you know, you, you, so basically, the point to take away is that the star is quite big, about 100 stellar radii in size, until several tens of solar masses, 30 or 40 solar masses. And at that point, for, for this accretion rate, um, you're now older than your Kelvin time, and you're contracting towards the main sequence. At this point, the radiation fields are going to be increasing, and the ionizing feedback, for example, is going to be increasing very rapidly. Excuse me? Sorry. The star is radiative. Yes. The opacities are um, well. We've we've not full solved the full structure, so we're using opacities, you know, from Opal, the, the Iglesias and Rogers '96 results for metal-free gas, but for the structure of the star, we are we are not really. You know, we are treating it as a, as a as one zone model with a po as a polytrope and just tracking that energy equation. So we don't do the, the full stellar structure. But we can, you can check after the fact whether it should be convective or radiative. 
and uh, you know that that's been that's already been checked in, in previous people's work. It's it's uh, it's uh, fully radiative, but at, at least on this pre-main sequence stage, when when you get to the, the, the nuclear burning, then it can ch it can change. Okay, so we need to work out the radiative uh, components then from this model. So there'll be some from an accretion disk, a boundary layer around the star, the star itself, and we can just add all these up. Uh, we see here for our fiducial model, we're sort of below the Eddington limits always, uh, which may or may not be relevant for anything. Um, we also add up, add up the ionizing photon output from these various components. And one thing to note here then is that basically there's very little ionization until you're contracting towards the main sequence, of course. So that's uh, you know really only once you're 30, 40 solar masses are we approaching typical O star that you would see today, that, that, that output. Just compare that to the main sequence then. So main sequence 10 solar mass star will obviously be much more ionizing photon output relative to our model. Um, but also the spherical accretion models, which had the photosphere not at the surface of the star, but out, out in the accretion flow, they put out very little ionizing photon flux, obviously, uh, to their surroundings because they have a very cool, very large photosphere. But any realistic model of, with rotation, you're going you're gonna to have significant ionizing photon output around 30, 40, 50 solar masses. OK. So these are the feedback stages we follow. I guess I'm running out of time, so I'll just have to go through this uh, quickly. Uh, Lyman alpha radiation pressure is one thing we looked at. Then expansion of the H2 region. And finally, once the H2 region has broken out of the accretion flow but failed to ionize the disk, um, we set up a process known as disk photoevaporation, where an ionized wind is driven from the surface of the disk, but the disk can still be fed uh, from equatorial regions which are shielded by this disk which has a thickness. So in the fiducial model, at about 50 solar masses, the H2 region is starting to reach a scale where the escape speed is now about the ionized gas sound speed. So that's at about 50 solar masses. Um, and then really what we think the final end game for this process is going to be is a competition, as I said, between disk photoevaporation rates and accretion rates. So Hollenbach et al. worked out you know, in a context of a simple model what these, accretion, these mass loss rates due to photoevaporation are. And so for a 100 solar mass star uh, with, a, with its typical, with the main sequence ionizing photon flux, that's going to drive a mass loss rate of just over 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year from its disk. So we just need to compare those accretion rates and, and the feeding rates. But the feeding rate, as I, was, as I mentioned, is, is, is being, has been reduced by the H2 region expansion. And so only part of the accretion flow can get in here, the part that's shielded by the disk. So we actually, have, not only do we have to solve the radial structure of the accretion disk, we also have to do a vertical uh, a model for the vertical structure of the disk as well to get an estimate of the, of the thickness of the disk. So a simple one, uh, one zone model of the vertical radiation transport through the disk, the scale height and the, and the photosphere of the disk. Um, this is the aspect ratio, so relatively thin disks, um, fairly constant aspect ratio as a function of uh, radius. Okay, so summarizing all these different things, we, we construct a sequence of models, basically a sequence of equilibrium models for the star and protostar and disk, um, and it's uh, the feedback, and we see then how that this secretion rate is going to be affected by the feedback. So this was a no feedback case as a function of stellar mass, the k primed of one, the accretion rate declining in time from about 10 to the minus two solar masses a year to about 10 to the minus three by the time you're a thousand solar masses. The H2 region breaking out then stops accretion from certain directions, and so at, a, at about 50 solar masses that kicks in, and the accretion rate declines. But it's not doesn't never goes to zero because you're shielded by your accretion disk. So that's these stages. But at the same time, then photoevaporation starts once you have ionized much of the volume of the sky above the disk, and that mass loss rate grows, and they cross at about 140 solar masses in this fiducial case. So that's you know that's our, this is our method to estimate what, what the mass scale of the first stars should be. And we can check the dependence on various things like ionized gas uh, temperature. We had 25,000 Kelvin before. 50,000 Kelvin makes very little difference. K primed of a half here. So a lower accretion rate. Um, you actually you, you break out of the H2 region earlier, and you will eventually end up with um, crossing at a lower mass, about, I think, 80 solar masses. And then the higher case, K primed of two, a five times higher accretion rate. 
Um, you, you break out later, and you only cross here to at about 300 solar masses. In these curves is a full treatment of the, st of the stellar evolution, the, the protostellar evolution, an estimate of the, of the, uh, the accretion disk, radial and, and, and vertical structure. Um, once we have that protostellar structure, we know the, the luminosity of the star, and we know it's ionizing photon output. Well, that's at the end of its life. We're still only a few thousand years into the stellar evolution here. That, that's three million years later. But that's the point. Do we reach those stars which can do that? And so we've defined a region of parameter space where you can, at least in the context of these models. Uh, the amount of rotation, it's very insensitive, actually, to, to reasonable amounts of rotation because um, basically you, you break out a little bit later or earlier, but you're still going to cross this photo evaporation point. This end, this end game of photo evaporation is not sensitive to the precise value of rotation un unless you get to very small values here. Okay, so these are the range of masses we've, we've predicted here. Um, we have an analytic uh, formula which tries to capture all this behavior. I uh, won't go into the details. Now, what are the uncertainties then? So the H2 region breakout, we've not, you know, it's just done analytically. Um, so we need to simulate, we're starting to simulate that to capture these processes which will basically tend to increase the, basically uh, make it easier for, for gas to still accrete. Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities and diversion of, of accretion flow to the equatorial plane rather than radial expulsion. Then the photo evaporation has uncertainties, of course, as well. This normalization of the hollenbach atel model needs to be checked. No one's really done that yet with, with simulations, but you need to follow the, radi the diffuse radiation. Um, and let's see here. So, and then the effect of protostellar outflows. We, I won't go into the details here. The protostellar evolution, our model is a spherical model, and the star is expected to be rotating. And in particular, that means the temperatures at the pole of the star will be hotter, and so that will um, reduce the ability of the star to, to stop accretion from the equatorial regions. Okay. So I think I should stop, right? Because I'm out of time. So I will try and say some of this tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? Well, yeah. Okay, so the, I, I have to repeat the question as well now for the microphone. So if, if we apply this kind of modeling for feedback processes for local star formation, uh, do we, what kind of answers do we get? Um, well, we haven't done it yet, but uh, you know, obviously, the difference is the fact we have dust grains, at, um, you know, uh, today, and so that affects uh, certainly the radiation pressure on dust will affect uh, the dynamics, but also in the H2 region that could affect things as well. So it's 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 but it's an interesting coincidence, maybe that uh, you know, actually our fiducial model had a, a, a maximum mass of about 150 solar masses, it's quite comparable to what is seen today. Um, but I, I think that's just a coincidence, to be honest. Um, so, but you know, we, we'd like we're going to move in those kinds of directions. Um, the, the structure of the core that's collapsing is um, actually fairly similar. If you look at its bulk physical properties, maybe I'll go through this diagram tomorrow. But um, if you look at just its bulk properties, include its its size and its density and so on. This population three core is very similar in density to say the Orion Nebula cluster proto core that made that, that whole cluster, and so the conditions are not so not so different in terms of dynamical times and so on, but it's the coupling of the of the feedback from the star to the gas which is quite different, and also the fragmentation properties. We, no one's seeing fragmentation in this in these uh, population three stars, and that's because the cooling is weak, and most of the pressure support is thermal. Whereas locally, this gas is supported not by thermal pressure, but by magnetic pressure and turbulence. 
So that, that's a fundamental difference. Well, we, we did look at that, actually. We looked at that. So um, assuming the, the, the field you generate by dynamo in the disk can become a large-scale field, which is an assumption, uh, then assuming it drives a large-scale outflow comparable to normal outflows that Chris Matzner, for example, has worked on, uh, we use Matzner's theory for the strength of these outflows to look at the, the um, efficiency of star formation from this halo. And basically, its efficiency was reduced to about 60% by the time the star was at about 100 solar masses. At least in the fiducial case, the radiative feedback shown by the red line becomes much smaller um, before that. So our conclusion from this is that the mechanical feedback is not as important as the radiative feedback in, this, in the fiducial case. Yeah, the outflow, the, the outflow puts most of its intensity in the poles, whereas most of the mass is coming from the equatorial region, so it's hard to stop that equatorial gas. So that's, that's a really interesting point, because for low mass, large mass, uh, generally, you know, you know very well the Bosch test is going to be equal to low mass, and that's going to be equal to large mass. The fact that it's really different, just for low mass stars, the only thing that would cause the difference would be the other thing, the mass effect of the cloud itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's already operating. Yeah. It's, it's, it's operating early on, but um, at least this, this collimated outflow, you know, so it, there's a wide angle component, but it's, it's still concentrated on the pole. Right, exactly. So I think the end. One of our main conclusions is, is the, end pro the physical process which sets the mass of the first stars is disk photoevaporation. And that process needs to be studied intensively now with uh, you know, better numerical methods. I know, we, we looked at all that. Yeah, we, we, no, that's included. That's included. Um, and, and also the, in, in the massive, well, the, the radiation pressure as well reduces the, um, changes the gravitational escape radius. They actually cancel those two effects. So, um, but, so 